Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for the joy that comes from your coming to earth. And we ask that as we turn our minds to the unexpected at Christmas, that you will say something unexpected to us this morning through your word. We ask that you will help us to focus ourselves and focus our priorities during this season in the right direction. And we ask these prayers in your name. Amen. Amen. So as I said at the beginning of the meeting, this is our third Sunday in Advent. That means we're the third Sunday in to this particular theme for this year of an upside down Christmas. The idea that Christmas still has something unexpected to say to us, however many times we may have heard the Christmas story. So hopefully the sermons that you've heard so far have been unexpected um, in the right way, hopefully. Jesus always brings the unexpected, and the Christmas story can still turn our world upside down this year. And the passage that we're looking at this morning, and you can see it on the screen, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, is nothing short of radical. It's radical. Paul, in this passage, commands us, encourages us, challenges us, to stop focusing on ourselves and instead to focus on other people. And in the world today, as perhaps it's always been, that is radical. And that's it. The message is to stop focusing on ourselves and to focus on other people. This could well be the shortest sermon that I've ever preached. It isn't, but it could be. because we do need to delve a little bit further into that message. Now, I have to admit straight away that I try, whenever I sit down and write a sermon, to preach to myself first before I even think about preaching it to anyone else. And this is probably one of the most difficult sermons that I've had to preach to myself before I come and preach it to you this morning. Because I have to admit that my heart is not always bent on putting other people before myself and focusing on other people. Quite often my priority is on self-focus and not on self-sacrifice. So before I preach a word to you, I promise you that again I've preached this message to myself before I speak to you. I don't know if you've noticed but people in our society are more isolated from each other than ever before. We are a nation, we are a world of individuals, more than we are a nation and a world of community, particularly in the Western world. It's ironic, really, because at least for those of us who are on social media, media we appear to be connected to thousands and thousands of people and yet we very rarely have just a few friends. And so we don't know what it's like to really know someone deeply and to be deeply known. To love and to be loved. To serve and to be served. But our passage this morning turns that world upside down. Because Paul says that you cannot be a Christian in isolation. Did you know that? You cannot be a Christian in isolation. If you have ever thought to yourself, you know what, I'd be a really good Christian if it wasn't for other people. It's not true. You cannot be a Christian in isolation. Because Paul says, if you're a Christian, then you will have compassion and sympathy for others. And you can't do that unless you're in community. If you love Jesus then deep down you will have a heart for people. You just can't help it if you're a Christian. If you love Jesus, you will have a heart for people. You may not always be obedient to that heart. You may not even be able to see it sometimes, but it is there. It is real. Paul says if you love God, then you love people. 
So let's have a look at these words together. Major Elaine is going to come and read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. If you're following in one of our Bibles, you'll find it on page 1179. Philippians chapter 2, the first 11 verses. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Challenging words this morning, words that turn our world upside down. Because the crux of what Paul is saying, I think, in this passage to the church at Philippi and then to ourselves, is that your spirituality, how spiritually mature you are, is measured by how you love and treat other people. It's not about how many years you've been a Christian. It's not about how clean and pressed your uniform is. It isn't about how many years you've played an instrument or sung in a choir or whatever. It is about how you love and treat other people. Now, I'm pretty sure that most people would agree with that statement. Hands up if you agree with that statement. Yeah, that loving and treating other people right is good. Yeah, most of you do that because we can all agree that with that statement. Until you find yourself around maybe a family at Christmas or maybe your core family, particularly in the middle of December when we start to get a bit tired and a bit grumpy and you find yourself next to that person who really rubs you up the wrong way particularly at this stressful time of year. And then you think, no, that's not got anything to do with my spiritual maturity. That's got to do with them. That's not got to do with me. If only that person that really winds me up would get themselves sorted out, I'd be a much better Christian. Ever thought that? I'm not asking for hands this time. You don't have to confess to everybody. You see, the world would say, it's not me, it's you. But Paul and Jesus says, no, 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 it's not them. It's me. We love to shift the blame, don't we? If only that other person got themselves sorted out, then I'd be a better person. But it's not about them. It's about us. Possibly one of the most difficult lessons I've learned in leadership over the last however many years is that you cannot change other people. Anybody else notice that? You cannot change other people. The only thing that we can change and the only thing that we can control is our response to those other people. And so Paul says... In verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in, in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also 
to the interests of others. That word look is really interesting. In the Greek, it's a military word. So it talks about strategy. It talks about figuring something out of plotting. If we are going to look to other people's interests, then it's something we have to think through first. It won't happen in the moment. We have to make the choice. We have to strategize and plot that we are going to look out for the interests of others before we look after our own interests. Paul is saying here, think hard about how you can put that other person before yourself. Because it doesn't come naturally to many of us. Because Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. He says that's the way the world works. The world would put selfish ambition or conceit first. That's what putting yourself first is. It's selfish ambition or other translations call it rivalry. Now, here's the thing in election week. Paul uses that word, selfish ambition, for the very worst kind of politician. I'm not going to mention any names, but the kind of politician who seems to be for the need of others, but is actually in it for themselves. That was the phrase that was used for politicians of that ilk in Paul's time. This idea of selfish ambition somebody who seems to be need for the needs of others but is actually in it for themselves and if we're honest with each other sometimes if we're not careful if we don't plan to put others per first if we don't strategize and focus on putting other people first then that's how we become we fall prey to the temptation of selfish ambition do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look, strategize, plan, plot, not only to look for our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Why is it that human nature is so selfish, is so keen on selfish ambition? Well, Paul puts it down to what he calls our empty conceit. Now, this comes from the Greek word kenodoxia. Kino simply means empty, and doxia is used to describe weightiness or significance or importance. So what Paul is saying here is that when we sense that our significance, our importance, almost our very identity is empty and plastic and superficial in some way, then we become frustrated and angry. We realise that we're not being, we haven't got integrity, we're not being honest with other people. And then we feel as if other people are not treating us in the way that we expect to be treated when we place our significance in what others think about us and feel about us, when we look to others for meaning, for significance and for purpose, then we can very often end up being angry with them because they don't treat us, they don't give us that significance, they don't give us that importance that we think we should have from them. So what's the solution? to all this well Paul says we need to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus we need to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus what is that mindset that mindset I think is to treat other people like they were royalty we are all children of God, so we are all royalty in that way. Now, if there's one thing that brings out selfish ambition and conceit in me, it's motorway driving. Now, unlike some people, I have no problem with drivers who stick to the speed limit. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever been out on the motorway sticking to the speed limit, and somebody will come up right behind you and flash their lights as if... Uh, you're doing something wrong. I don't have any problem with, any, with people sticking to the speed limit on the motorway. What I do have a problem with is those very annoying people who stick to the speed limit in the middle lane of the motorway. 
Now, I know some people who will come up to those people on the middle lane in the motorway, overtake them, and then make some kind of elaborate hand gesture towards them. Now, I spend most of my time in Salvation Army uniform these days, so that's not an option anymore. Not that I ever did that, of course. <laughs> but I do have a look, a hard stare, for those who insist on hogging the middle lane at 70 miles an hour. I wonder what would happen if one day I overtook one of those drivers in the middle lane of the motorway and gave them that look, that hard stare, and discovered that it was Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> she doesn't live that too, too far away from here, so it's not that far-fetched. I think I'd be pretty ashamed and embarrassed. Why? Because I think that Her Majesty the Queen is better than me or above me. She is the Queen, after all. And Paul kind of says that if I want to be like Jesus, if I want to have the mindset of Jesus, then I need to treat everyone like that. Then I need to treat everyone as if they are above me or better than me. Because actually what we think about them is not nearly as important as how we act towards them. C.S. Lewis wrote these words. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And one of the ways that we can put that into practice is to think that others are royalty, just as we might sometimes think of ourselves as royalty. We are all children of God. This kind of humility of not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less, matters most, perhaps, when it comes to the idea of forgiveness. Miroslav Volf, who is a Croatian theologian, wrote these words, forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. That's quite deep for a Sunday morning, isn't it? Have a look at those words. Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. We exclude ourselves from the community of sinners by saying, well, I'm not so bad. It's the other person. The other person needs to sort themselves out. I'm not really a sinner, I'm a good Christian. But how do we exclude our enemy from the community of the human race? It's when we find ourselves thinking things like, I could never do what they did to me. How dare they do that to me? I know we're all human, I know that that person is human just like me, but I would never sin like that. I would never be that kind of human. When we think of others that way, we make them subhuman. We exclude them from the community of the human race. And then that justifies our unforgiveness. They're, they're something less than human, so we don't have to forgive them. They're something less than we are. And we exclude ourselves from the community of sinners. Because actually the community of the human race and the community of sinners, it's the same thing. Our pride tempts us to judge for ourselves, or judge ourselves by our strengths and judge other people by their weaknesses. Have you ever noticed that? We judge ourselves by our own strength and we judge others by their weaknesses. And that enables us to stand above them to see ourselves as better than them, or somehow above them. It's our willingness to forgive each other that proves the true depth of our community, that proves the health of our relationships. The extent to which we're prepared to forgive each other will define how deep this community will be. Now this isn't about live and let live, 
because that's simply burying our heads in the sand, brushing issues under the carpet and hoping they'll go away. That's not real community. If we're not having hard conversations about how sometimes we hurt each other, if we're not doing the hard graft of solving the conflicts between us, if we're not able in the spirit of love to challenge and rebu rebuke each other and to seek forgiveness from each other, then this really is not a community. It's hard work. It's not easy. So how can we carry out this hard work? How can we ensure true community of healthy and loving relationships between us? Well, this morning I don't have any easy steps to offer you. I don't have five ways to good community or five ways to forgiveness or five ways to humility. And you might be wondering, as you have perhaps over the last couple of weeks, well, what on earth has this got to do with Christmas? Well, the reason it has something to do with Christmas is that whilst I don't have easy steps to offer you, what I do have to offer you is a person, an example. Because that person, as Paul points out in this passage, is the incarnation. God came down to us in the person of Christ Jesus, born to poor parents in a messy and smelly environment. God has entered our mess. He's entered our relationships. He's moved into our neighbourhood. He's emptied himself of all but love. And when we reflect on this, when we reflect what God has done for us in love, how God has humiliated himself in the person of the baby Christ Jesus, then we'll be able to love others through the love that he gives us, even when they don't deserve it, or perhaps particularly when they don't deserve it. We'll be able to love them and forgive them, just like Jesus has loved and forgiven us. So as we come to the end of our meeting this morning, who is it that God is prompting you to love like this, this Christmas? It might be a member of your family. It might be a friend or a neighbour. It might be somebody here. It might be a work colleague, someone at school. Who is God prompting you to love like Jesus loves us this Christmas? Who is it that you need to forgive? We can take the opportunity this morning to ask God to fill us with his Christmas love once more and mould our minds to be like his. We're going to sing a final carol together 102 in Christmas collection second verse of this song says though laid in a manger he came from a throne on earth though a stranger in heaven he was known how lowly how gracious he's coming to earth and here's the thing about loving like Jesus his love my love kindles if we're going to love like Jesus, if we're going to forgive like Jesus, if we're going to have a mindset like Jesus, then it's his love that is going to kindle our love. His love, my love kindles to joy in his birth. Let's stand and we'll sing these two verses, please.
And so, rejoice in God always. And again, I say rejoice. For God has created you with the capacity for joy. Let us find what makes us joyful and make that our gift to the world. Trust in God's will for all of creation and open yourself to God's gentle, transforming love. Let us welcome new possibilities in our lives. Let us offer ourselves up to God's goodness and let us go forth in hope and peace and joy. Amen. God bless you.